the, in Hebrews, it says today, when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, don't harden your hearts like they did in the wilderness, right? The whole purpose of that teaching is to say, when God begins to speak to your heart, don't shut it off. Don't run away from it, but go to it and open yourself up. Yeah, it might, it might hurt a little. What do you mean by that? It might be difficult. That's what I mean. It might be hard for you to maybe give God some things today that you should have given him a long time ago. But I believe that God's going to do something today. And I believe it's going to start with the understanding of his love and who he is in his love. And that's what was happening to me. This message is just, it's, it's crazy how God put this on my heart. You know, first off, I, I had no idea that I was going to be speaking un, until Thursday, which is fine. I had plenty of time because God was already doing stuff in me. You know, he kind of prepares us when we don't even realize we need to be prepared. And I actually went to youth camp this summer with, a, with another church, with my brother-in-law's church. And he had called me about a week and a half before they were going. And he said, hey, man, we don't have a youth pastor. We don't have any male leaders. You're one of the only guys I know that's available that can, knows how to, you know, you know the ins and out of camp. You know how it works. Could you just please, do you, do you mind helping us? And I said, sure, I'd love to. No problem. So it happened to be that the camp that they were going to worked out and I didn't really miss any work because of it or anything like that. So that worked out. But the amazing thing is, of course, then I got to go with the kids who were from this church as well because they went to the same camp and I didn't know they were going to go to the same camp. So I enjoyed that even more because I got to interact with them again and I got to pray with them again and I got to be in the cabin with them again, you know, with the boys and smell all their stinky farts again. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. You know, not the farts. Being with them was wonderful. Okay. But I'm like the only person that get away with saying fart in a preaching sermon. I'm kidding. I'm just trying to lighten the mood. Open your hearts. But the first night that we're at this camp, you know, sometimes if we're not careful as leaders, especially when we go to these camps, we can just say, this is about the kids, this is about the kids, this is about the kids, and it always is about them. But God also has something for the leaders too. And I was praying for the kids, but when I was there, I felt like the Lord told me in my personal time, I felt like he said, I want you to go back to the cabin and I want you to read the whole book of 1 John. It's not a long book. It's like five chapters. You know, that's not too bad. So I'm like, okay, Lord. So we get back to the cabin. It's late. So I'm like, in the morning, I'm going to get up early and read. And that's what I did. I got up the next morning and I read through the whole book of 1 John. And I got to this verse, 1 John. You don't have to pull it up yet because I'm not going to read it yet. But I got to 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. And it was like God just, he just did something in me. I can't even explain. And I was reading it and I just kept reading it and reading it and reading it. And I was just like, oh, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for what you're telling me right now. Thank you for what you're showing me. And so we, you know, get all the kids up and we go to breakfast. And then when we get done with breakfast, we have a big leaders meeting where all the youth pastors and leaders, they go into the sanctuary and all the kids go out and they play games. And the rec crew takes care of the kids so they're not alone. And so we're in there and we're having this time of prayer and this time of worship. And, and you know, our leaders were like, hey, just spread out everywhere in the room. It doesn't matter. You can, you can start running laps in the Holy Spirit. You can lay down in the Holy Spirit. We just want you to be refilled. You just want you to be touched today. And so I just took my Bible and I went back into that back room into the corner and I just kept reading 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. I just kept reading it over and over and over. And I was just praying through it and reading it. And we get done with that and we go play some more games with the kids and then we go have lunch and then after lunch we do cabin devotions. And so... We have all the boys in the cabin of, of all the churches on our side. We just were like, hey, let's all just do it together, you know, not break up as into groups, but as churches, but we'll do it together. And, and I've never seen this cabin devotion before. They're made by the district by somebody else in advance. And I open it up. And the main verse is 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. And I about freaked out in my little bunk and all these kids you know they're all sweaty they don't eat, they're just like you know I just ate lunch I'm full like you know what I mean like they don't they're just like you know and I'm over here like oh my gosh what in the world how does this happen but God was just putting this in my heart and so this is what it says I'm reading out of the new living translation 
First John chapter four, verse nine and 10. This is what I'm gonna preach on. It says, God showed us, God showed, showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. Verse 10, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. You may say, that's some very basic stuff. You're coming in here very basic. Well, I think the issue for all of us is is we've forgotten some very basic things. I had forgotten some very basic things in my ministry. You may say, well, what do you mean? You know, my wife and I, we haven't been here in this church in full-time ministry for, I don't know, three and a half months now. It feels like 20 years. It feels weird. I've been working a secular job. But the first two months were very hard. Hard because, one, I didn't want to leave here. And hard because, because two, I spiritually had forgotten some things. You said, you a pastor? Yeah, me a pastor. If we're being honest, let's be honest. I had let some things in my life shift. And you say, well, what do you mean? Like your faith, what you believe, you know, how you, how you live? No, no, no. I had let the desire of my heart shift. And it had no longer been about this is real love. And it had been more about I need to get this done. I need to do this. I need to focus on this. I need to work on this. But the foundation, I, I, had, I had changed it. And I realized something. I had been operating not out of the love that I have for Jesus, but out of the need to feel like I'm doing what Jesus is wanting me to do. And if we're not careful as Christians, we can do that. Now, there's, let me understand. There's a place for those things, meaning like how we work and how we pursue the Lord and how we do the things of God. Yes, but it always has to come out of his love first. It always has to come out of that steadfast love that J.R. spoke of first. And God was reminding me, Reese, I know you love me, but you forgot how much I loved you. You forgot how much I loved you. And you see, how much I love you is what's going to cause you to love them. It's what's going to cause you to live for me. It's what's going to cause you to want to pursue me and know me. And so I was sitting there in the sanctuary and I was realizing something. This is real love. Not that I love God, but God, he loves me. You see, that's real love. Not that I love him first, but that he loves me first. I have a quick testimony I want to add with this because brother came up here for an ear problem and my mom was at this one. Years ago, I was 14 years old. Didn't, didn't care a single thing about Jesus. But my mom had me go to VAR one day. I was going for a basketball tryout. She may remember this. And she's here. She could testify. I, I went to VAR with her because she wanted the ladies to pray over my left ear because I had gotten an ear infection and I couldn't hear out of it. And let me tell you this. If you're going to go to a basketball tryout for an AAU team, you better make sure you can hear out of your left ear. Because if there's somebody running by you, if there is a ball coming by you, if the coach is yelling at you and you can't hear a thing, you're going to look like a fool. And so she said, listen, I know, I don't know what you feel about this. I don't know what you think about this. She probably, she probably remembers this. She does. But all these ladies, Missy was there, my mother-in-law, who I didn't even know was going to be my mother-in-law. She was there. They took me into this back room and like threw me in this chair. And they just start like laying hands on me and praying over me. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, I'm just sitting here. I'm 14 year old me, you know, no beard. I look like a little kid. You know what I mean? I'm just sitting there. I'm like, oh, you know, they're praying over me. Right. And I felt something. I felt something move over my body, but I didn't know what it was. And I get up, they get done praying, and they're like still lingering, you know what I mean? They're lingering. And like, I'm like, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, uh, you know, I'm just so freaked out. I don't know what's going on. And I take three steps out the door, my ear pops, and it opens, and I never had any more pain again. And you know what the greatest thing about that was? I turned back around and I was like, hey guys, the weirdest thing happened. My ear just popped, like, and I can hear it. Like, it's like perfect. Everything feels really good. And those ladies are like, praise God. You know, they're like jumping around, they're running around the room, they're like, woo, yeah, you know what I mean? They're all freaking out. And I'm like, 
I'm going to go to the bathroom still. Like, I don't know what's going on here. Why do I share that testimony? Because God loved me first. Wait, you got healed and you didn't know Jesus? Yeah, because God loved me first. He loved me first. He loved me when I didn't love him. He loved me when I didn't care about him. He loves me that much. You see, that's what real love is. My question this morning to you as a church is this, what's compelling you as Christians in your daily life? What is compelling you? What is stirring your heart? What is pushing you into the presence of God? Is it because you feel like you have to, because it's this duty, because it's this thing that is required of you, or is it because you love him because he knows, you know how much he loves you first, right? You've experienced his love, and his love for you, it changed you. It set you free. All of who we are and what we know as followers of Jesus, it starts with this very thing, God's love. How does it, why and how does it start with God's love? Because God was so compelled by his great love for me and you, that's why he sent Jesus. And I think we get lost in the shuffle of that because we're trying to do so much for God and we're believing so much for God and all of those things are good. But if we forget how much he loves us, you know, Paul wrote a whole chapter on this, right? 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to address that in a little while. But if we're not operating first out of the understanding of God's love for us, how can we understand how to communicate the gospel to other people? Because that's what the gospel is. It is that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to save us from our sins so that we could have eternal life. It starts there. Do we understand? Do you understand how much God loves you? Or is it something that you hear about and you agree with in a theological level and you agree with in a scriptural level, but you haven't in your own heart taken the time to experience God's love? You say experience. What are you getting all emotional? No, no, no. I'm not talking about emotion because I'm going to tell you right now, when I was in that sanctuary at camp, I didn't start crying. It was like God unlocked my heart and said, here you go. This is what you've been missing. You put the, you closed the door on it. You got hung up on other things and you forgot about how much I loved you. And that's why I called you. And that's why I moved in your life. Do we understand this? Is it the very thing that is compelling you and I to live a life that honors and glorifies God? That he loves us. That he truly loves us. When we understand the power of God's love, we understand literally the gospel. You fully understand the gospel. The gospel is that very thing. God's love sets us free from sin's power. It brings us into relationship with Jesus and God again. And then what happens is, is now we can live out of God's love. You see, that's, that's the thing that's going to change stuff around us. I was at that camp, that very camp, and this young lady that was a part of the other church's group, you know, she was like, she was one of those like feisty young ladies who just like really liked the to push the envelope with the leaders. You know what I mean? We'd be like, let's go to the cafeteria. I don't want to go to the cafeteria. Like, oh, okay, listen, everybody has to go there. Like, there's not a McDonald's. We can't take you somewhere else. You got to eat the food. Like, you know what I mean? It was just like one of those girls, and we loved her. We didn't get onto her. We understood where she was. But it was the last night, and she, she had been really apprehensive to like God moving and like she would go down and experience and then we'd be like so what happened she'd be like I ain't telling you what happened we'd be like that's a part of the testimony you know what I mean like you want to share what's going on she's like you can't make me talk I'm like okay all right cool we are not gonna make you talk all right whatever you and Jesus had down there it was real because I saw you you look like you know you needed 25 tissues so I know something happened but she came up to me in the middle of the service. We're in worship close to the end. And she just walked up to me and she said, can you just pray over me? And I said, of course. She didn't tell me what to pray. She didn't tell me how to pray. But this is what I prayed. 
I just started praying 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. I just started praying about God's love. And I just started saying, Holy Spirit, reveal your love to this. And I kid you not, it was like I felt the Spirit of God move off of me and move on to this girl. And she started to weep. And we could feel, I could feel the love of God. She could feel the love of God. And she said, I never felt love like this before. And I said, this is real love. This is what God has for you. This is how God sees you. And you see, this young girl, she comes from a broken home, broken family. She never knew what that that real love was, but she walked away from that moment touched by God's love. You see, when we understand this, it's not because we're perfect. It's not because we were perfect. It's because that God simply loves us. And Jesus was sent for us. He loves us so much to free us from our sin and to give us eternal life. It all starts with that love. Do we see God through this lens of perfect and unconditional love? I think there's people in this room who see God like they see their dad. I think you see God how you saw a family member. You see God out of the aspect of human love. And you have to get past that because God loves his love. The scripture says, can we understand his love? It's it's too high. It's too deep. It's too wide, right? Right? It goes beyond all understanding, his love. But you see, if we try to try to put God's love in an idea of what we think love is, we'll never ex- fully experience it because it'll be tainted by the human heart, because it'll be tainted by human experience. And some of those kids at that camp and some people I know, especially adults, that's why they have a hard time receiving from God is because when they hear, well, God, your father, they think about their father. They're like, man, if God's my father, I don't want him to be like my father. See, see what I'm saying? You, you begin to put a perception of God on things that is not who God is. And we have to make a choice to say, God, I'm going to see you for what your word says. Your word says that you loved me before I ever loved you, that you sent your son for me. Then, God, I am enough because of what you've done. You love me that same way every single day. And I believe that Jesus wants to fill our hearts with God's love in such an amazing and powerful way that it will compel you to live in that same type of love for everyone else. Do you want to know why people struggle, especially Christians, with loving other Christians and loving other people? It's because we're not first operating out of God's love. We're operating out of our human love. See, the Bible says to love our enemies. How many of you in here have been doing that on a daily basis. The Bible says to love those who hate you, to love those who persecute you, to love those who beat you. Uh, Listen, I'm talking to myself. This is what I mean. God was like totally just messing me up because he was saying, have you been doing that, Reese? Have you been loving the people around you like I love you? Because I'm a representation of God, right? I'm not God, but he lives in me. The Holy Spirit lives in me, and I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits is love. And if we're called to be the branch to the vine, what does the branch do? It produces fruit, right? But if I'm not producing love, then what fruit am I producing? If if I'm not producing those things in my life, then what am I producing? And if it's not coming first from the vine, which is Jesus, then what is it? You see, this is, this is what God was showing me. And I begin to think about the people all around me. Am I loving the lost people like I love my family? Like I love my family or my friends? Am I loving my enemies like God calls me to love them? Am I loving them from that place? And see, this is the thing. I think revival starts when the love of God is moving in our hearts in such a powerful way that it's just like what Jesus did on the cross. Why would Jesus take the cross? Why would he take the cross? Jesus would never take the cross from a human standpoint. Jesus would have never taken the cross if he first didn't have God living in him as the very son of God and walking in God's perfect love. He would have never been able to take the cross because there's no man on earth without God who would do that. I don't believe there is. And that's what he did. You see, Jesus was filled with this same exact love. And in 1 John, this book, at the very end, he says we should walk as Jesus walked. We should live as Jesus lived. 
So are we loving in that same way? The love that moves us to go into dark places and to be his light through his power and through his gospel and through his Holy Spirit so that we see change in our cities and in our world. But if we aren't living out of God's love, how can we truly love like he calls us to love? How can we care for people? See, the Bible also says this. There's a portion of scripture. I can't give you the exact number and location, but you'll know it when I hear it. I believe it was Paul or or it could have been Jesus, but he says, when you love someone that loves you, how easy is that, right? I'm paraphrasing. But when you can love people that hate you, what does that show them? That shows them, yeah, real love. God's love, because there's people in this room, you may, this may be your testimony, you hated God at one point. You didn't love God, but what did he do? He loved you, he loved you, he loved you. He kept pursuing you in love, he loved you, and he loved you, and he loved you, to the point where you said, I'm still overwhelmed by this, why do you keep loving me? I started to think about all the people Jesus met. Remember the adulterous woman? Remember her? The Pharisees bring her in, right? And they're like, yeah, we're going to get Jesus on this one. And what's that story, right? She stands before all of them, and they're like, hey, Jesus, look, we found this woman. We even caught her in the act of adultery. And guess what? What does the law say about this? And then Jesus begins to say to them, well, the first one who has no sin cast that first stone, right? You see, Jesus didn't see her through man's love. He saw her through God's eyes of love. And he saw that this woman, she didn't need him to berate her. She didn't need him to, 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 she already knew she was wrong. She already knew it. But when he told her and showed her grace and mercy in his love, it changed her life. When she said, when he looked at her and said, woman, where's your accusers? He was showing her mercy They're gone. When he said to her, go sin no more, he was showing her grace and forgiveness in what? God's love. What is it going to be that reaches people in Mesquite and reaches people in your, you got families in your, you have, we all have family members in this place. Let's get real. Let's get real, okay? Let's, Let's be real. We have family members in our lives who don't know Jesus. And they're so turned off from the church because they have a a total misconception of how God sees them and loves them. And what does he call us to do? You know, recently, since I moved back down to where I live, I got plenty of time. Sorry, I thought I didn't have enough time. I got plenty of time. Oh, yeah, we're good. My uncle, he moved back. And I've shared stories about my uncle with some of you. But my uncle had a real big problem with me loving Jesus and being a minister. He told me that to my face. And we had some moments, and we had some reconciliation, and we had some forgiveness. And I'm sitting in this warehouse, and I'm with him because he didn't have a job job at the time, and he was needing to pull wire out of a building. Has anybody ever done that before? Have you ever pulled wire, copper wiring out of a building? Let me just say... It is not fun. I'm talking we're up in the air. We're pulling yards and yards of wire into piles because he needed some money, and this was a way to make some quick money, and he did make money, and I'm just pulling wire with him for hours, pulling wire with him for hours. And you know what? My uncle doesn't serve Jesus. He would tell you that. He would tell you he doesn't serve Jesus. But in that moment, I didn't need him to hear about how great the theological mindset of religion was. He just needed somebody to stand next to him and pull wire with him. So I just stood next to him and I pulled wire with him. That's all I did. I didn't care what he said. I didn't care what he felt like. And you know what? God started to move because then he started to talk about some things that happened in his life with me. And God started to move in his heart. And so we get done pulling wire and and one of his former bosses who had just retired, we were in the actual business building that they worked in. They had sold the business and then they were demolishing the building. So that's why we were pulling the wire. He shows up, right? Another 
like rough and tough, you know, country guy. And we're sitting around and they're laughing and cracking jokes. They're drinking beer. They're smoking cigarettes. And I'm sitting there with them. And his, his former boss goes, so Reese, what do you do? And I go, well, I'm a pastor. <laughs> he goes, we're, we're sitting here drinking beer in front of the pastor. We're smoking cigarettes in front of the pastor. We're cursing in front of the pastor. You know what he told me? He said, you're the first pastor I've ever met that's sitting in this room with me. Wow. You know what happened? The guy who used to be his boss grew up AG. And I started preaching the gospel to him. He started listening to it. He goes, you're AG, aren't you, boy? I said, yes, sir. He goes, I grew up AG. And he looked at my uncle and he said, that once saved, always saved stuff. It's a load of crap. My uncle's looking at him. I'm looking at my uncle. I'm looking at him. I'm thinking, I didn't say that. I'm quiet. I'm just over here to be in the, I'm just here, you know. He says, I know my life isn't perfect right now. I know I'm not doing the right things. But I appreciate that you sat down here with me and you just loved me. He turned to my uncle and he said, everything he says, you listen to him because he's right. And this was a man who had been a deeply close friend with him for almost 20 years. And he took his word as his bond almost. And in that moment, I realized something. God was doing something there. You see, I was, I was just loving. You say, what, did you ever tell him you love him? Yeah, of course. I hugged him. I told him I loved him. But sometimes our love has to be expressed through our actions of what we do. And if we're not compelled first by the Holy Spirit to do those things, we'll say no. We will say no because our flesh will take over. And our flesh will go, I don't want to go pull wire. That sounds boring. You may say, well, did you get something from it? No, I didn't. Because that wasn't the point. So that's the next thing. If we're pursuing God only for what he can give us, are we really pursuing it out of that real love? Right? Are we, are we doing things in that way because we're just wanting God to bless us? Or are we doing them out of first knowing how much he loves us and then in return saying, God, I love you. And that's why I'm doing it. I want us to watch this quick video. This will blow your mind. Brother Jason sent this to me. It's a quick little video about a man who was a Satanist who got saved. It's like a minute, maybe a minute and a half. Is it good? I did this interview, and in this interview I said, I don't believe that Jesus Christ exists. And after the interview, this lady came to me, and she hugged me, and she held me in a way that I've never been loved. I saw this woman is a Christian. I've never had, I've never experienced a Christian showing that much love and acceptance unconditionally. After that interview, I had a meeting with council members at that at the church and they said, okay, great, now we've done all these interviews and people know and it's growing, Satanism is growing, and believe me, people, it is. And I had to do a ritual by myself to see how do I get more, more power, more influence. And I did this ritual, and I opened myself up, and Jesus appeared, and I was extremely cocky, and I said, if you are Jesus, you need to prove it. And he flooded me with the most beautiful love and energy, and I recognized it immediately because that woman at the radio station showed it to me. That's how I recognized the love of Christ immediately because four people showed it to me and I didn't understand it at the time. I couldn't understand it because, like I said, I didn't believe. Even when I was in Christian ministry almost 20 years ago, I never knew it until a month or two ago. The love of Christ is unconditional. When you experience it, it is something different. I have for a long time believed that I am not worthy of God's grace. Let me tell you something today. The kingdom of God is not a gated community. The kingdom of God is open to everybody. It's my prayer that you will, you will feel the love 
I, I, I pray that the peace of, of Christ will be with you. This guy served Satan. And because of a lady who came up and hugged him, he experienced the love of God. You say, well, is that scriptural? Well, I mean, they used to take T-shirts off of Paul and put them on demon-possessed people, and they would go out of them. So you mean to tell me that physical contact of loving that person changed his whole life? See, I love what he said. He said, I had four people explain Jesus to me, but I didn't understand it. He said, even when I was in ministry 20 years ago, I didn't believe And what changed it for him? A passing moment with a lady who hugged him, showed him the love of God, and then when he went to go do his seance later, Jesus showed up. See, I think this same thing is out there And God's calling you to do that same thing. He's calling you to be that love of Jesus Christ to those people. And through the testimony of his love, through the testimony of his goodness, and you being in his love and walking in his love and seeing them in his love, they will experience that. And their hearts will be opened to the gospel because they'll say, well, nobody else has loved me like this. Nobody else has ever seen me like this. What is this? And they'll receive Jesus. You see, just like this man, there's people out there. They don't need to necessarily be told all the perfect, you know, spiritual things. That time will come. Because when they give their hearts to Jesus, God will then direct them and we'll begin to disciple them and love them and teach them. Those times will come. But initially, they need to understand the gospel and understand how much God loves them. That's why he's wanting to save them. Because he loves them. There's no other religion, I believe, on this earth that teaches this, that shows this. Everything's about self, self, self. I mean, even Satanism, what do you say? I'm going in there to get more, more power. How do I get more power for me? Because he wasn't satisfied. Because only the love of God will satisfy you in such a way that you'll experience true peace and true joy and true strength. That's the only way. That's the only way. Listen to this, 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. It says, dear friends, John says, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought, I love this, to full expression in us. Notice, when we love one another with the love of God, God himself, his love is expressed in its fullest and it's shown and it's seen. It says, verse 13, and God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he is in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world and all who declare that Jesus is the son of God have God living in them. They live in God and we know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love says God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them and I and I I highlighted this on my my page and as we live in God I love this our love grows more perfect wow so the more I live in God's love the more God's love perfects me. It makes my love more perfect. It makes my desires more perfect. The more I walk and live in that place of unconditional love, the greater and the more perfect I can love others. You say, how do I get there? It is so easy. You just open your heart up and you receive it. You see, that's, that's where I had had a hard time. See, I'd gotten in the ins and out of doing things in my life. And the simplistic idea of all I had to do was just receive it. It didn't even cross my mind because I felt like I had to work for it. I felt like I had to figure out how to earn it. See, I think there's some people here that feel that same way. If I could have somebody just come and play. And we're going to have a prayer time at the end. 
because I believe God wants to change some things in our hearts. And you see, it's only going to change if we go to him. If we go to him. If we go to him, that's the only way it's going to change. It says, finishing verse 17, it says, So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. The byproduct of living more and more in God's great perfection of love in our lives and our hearts is that we draw closer and nearer to God and we learn how to love greater and desire to love people all around us. When's the last time you prayed and said, God, I want you to fill me with such a love for people that it would burst my soul, that my soul would long to love people like you love them, Jesus, would long to see them like you see them, Jesus, would long to talk to them like you talk to them, Jesus. But that person, he's homeless and he's all weird and he's talking funny, he smells funny. It doesn't matter. God loves him. That family member, you don't know what they said to me. Well, first off, you need to go to the Lord and you need to ask for forgiveness and you need to release that unforgiveness in your heart and then you need to go back and you need to love them. But you just don't understand. They were so mean to me. Does it sound like God's love's there? sounds like bitterness. The Bible says, let not the root of bitterness enter your heart. Why? Because bitterness will drive you away from living in God's love. Because you'll always have that crutch to stand on, right? That, that crutch to say, oh, they did this. And God's saying, give it up and love me and love them like I first loved you. What if God, what if God did that to you and I? Sorry, Reese. You cursed too many times in your life. Remember that time when you used my name in vain like 100 times on that random Monday when you were 15? Sorry. Just too many times. Remember when you did all of those evil things and said all of those evil things and hurt all those people? Sorry. What if he did that to us? But what does it say? When we never loved him, he first loved us. And that is real love. That is what real love is. I believe that if we make this choice like I've made, that we'll see God do great things in our hearts. And I'm going to say this, ever since that last Monday, something has been different for me. I've been able to fast. I've been able to pray. I've been able to want to do these things that I never wanted to do before. And I think it just started with the fact that I had just forgotten how much he loved me. And I had let myself get to that place of operating, not out of his love, just out of duty and necessity. And so I believe that there's people here who feel this same way or might be going through this same thing. And I would ask that you would receive and open your heart today. I want to read a few more scriptures because I really want you to understand this. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and self-discipline. And I think sometimes when we hear that scripture, we go to three other things before we get to the fourth. We go to how God hasn't given us fear. We go how to how God's given us power. And we go to how God's given us self-discipline. But we, we put love last. I think we do. Because we live in a world where that word has been so tainted and destroyed that we really don't even want to think about that concept yet. Because, man, I got the power. Because, man, I got the self-discipline. Because, man, I don't have any fear. You do. Those, that scripture is 100% true. But you also have God's love. And it is for you. And you can have it today. You know, there's another scripture in 1 John. And this is what it says. I love it. It says, perfect love, what? Casts out all fear. 
wait, I never have to have a spirit of fear. Why? Because if I'm walking in perfect love and I know how much he loves me, nothing will scare me because I know he loves me. I know he's with me. I know he's right next to me. I think that's why Paul was so able to do what he did because he had experienced God's love and grace and it was so real in his life. I think that's why he was able to be unashamed for the gospel. Because he knew no matter shipwreck. That's why when he's on the boat, I love it, right? The, sh- the boat's going down. Everybody's freaking out. Everyone's like, we're all going to die. Paul's like, no, we're not going to die. We're not going to die. Why aren't we going to die, Paul? Because I'm here and he loves me. He told me I was going to make it. And I'm here and he loves me. Right? Think about it. Think about this, guys. And we get to this scripture, and, and, and I think we and this is another chapter that at times we pull it out at seasons. But listen to this, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. I'm going to read the whole thing. It says, if I could speak, this is Paul, if I could speak all the, all the languages of the earth and of the angels, but I didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Wow. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all of his knowledge and if I had such faith that I could literally move mountains but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. This isn't just for married people, everyone. We read this and we put it into married context. Yes, he, he does. this is relating to those things, but understand this, God's love, it's patient, it's kind. God's love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand in its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustices, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It always is hopeful, and it endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown language and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Wow. How many of us pursue prophecy and speaking in unknown languages? I do. But how many of us say, I'm going to pursue the love just as much. There's nothing wrong with wanting those things, but if you forget the basis of where you're coming from, then why are you doing it? Like he said, if I could speak all the languages of the earth, if I could reach all the people and do all of these great things, all these miracles, I mean, he even says, if I could literally walk out and move a mountain. How many of you would like to do that? I think that'd be pretty cool. He's like, literally, if I do all of those things, which are great, which are spiritual high points, which are victories, but I don't love, then I've gained absolutely nothing. There's nothing there to gain. Then look at the last verse, verse 13. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And which is the greatest? love because this is why it's the greatest out of God's love comes faith out of God's love comes hope out of God's love comes Jesus on the cross giving life to every lost person look at 1 John chapter 5 and then we're going to pray Verse 20 and 21, it says, And we know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God, and he is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. You see, if I let something take the place of God and his love in my heart, then I'm drifting off into a a place that I have no idea where I'm gonna go. But if I stand firm in his love and I stand firm in who he is and I keep myself close to him, I'll know everything I need to know, right? Amen. Let's all close our eyes for a moment. Let's just begin to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit right now. 
God, I, I believe that there's people here, the Lord, that are going through this very thing. They love you, God, but I think that they haven't experienced your love as much as, Lord, you want them to. That, Lord, I think that as time goes on, when we first beat you, Jesus, that unconditional love, it's so real. It compels us. But as time goes on, we let the things of the world, maybe even things of just religion itself, begin to shift our focus. And, and, and Lord, we, we could catch ourselves falling into this idea of, I have to work for your love. I have to work for your love, Father. But the reality is, is God, I don't have to work for your love. Because you loved me ever before I even loved you. And so, Lord, I pray for every heart in this place this morning to receive that. If you would like to just receive that right now with your eyes closed, just lift your hand up right now. If you want to receive a greater outpouring of God's love, you say, Pastor Reese, I need a greater touch of his love. I need to feel his love today because without his love, I don't think I'm going to make it. Thank you. Thank you. I see you. I see all of you with your hands raised then I just want you to do this. Pray with me. You don't have to pray exactly what I pray, but pray in your heart and ask the Lord to fill you with that love. Ask him. And if there's something in your heart, and, and, and I add this to it, if there's anybody in this place who has unforgiveness towards a family member, a friend, a person, bitterness, maybe that's you. Raise your hand if that's you. If you have some unforgiveness in your heart and you need to forgive someone, don't wait. Don't wait. Give it up right now. Give it to Jesus. Let his love change your heart. Let his love take that out because God forgave you. Let's pray for these things. First, Father, I pray for those who raised their hand. And if you raise your hand, you lift your hands again. Lift both your hands to the Lord right now. If you raise your hand and you want his love, you want a greater measure of that love in your life, and you want to see that love moved through your life in a greater way through the Holy Spirit, just lift your hand. Father, I pray for every hand that's raised in this place. God, I pray that you would overwhelm them with your love right now. That, Lord, you would pour your love out to them in such a powerful way that, Father, you would reveal Reveal to them, Lord, the first truth that, God, you first loved us before we ever loved you, and that's why you sent Jesus. And that's why, Lord, we can have Jesus in our hearts, and we can live and follow you and believe in faith in you because you first loved us, God. You loved us so much. God, I pray that that love would just be poured out right now to every person who has their hand raised, Lord, and that, Lord, you would overwhelm them in the evening, in the morning, in the middle of their day, Lord, with your love love. That, Lord, when they go to pray, it would be out of this understanding of, God, I'm here because first I know you love me, and next I love you. And, Lord, whatever you decide to do now through this prayer time, let it be done out of your love. That, God, their hearts would burn for a love and a passion for the lost souls of the people around them. That, Lord, their, their hearts would be broken like your heart, Lord, in love for the people who are dying and who are going to hell. For the family members who, Lord, they have complete access to, to love, yet they're afraid to love, or they're not willing because, Lord, of something that happened before or in the past, but that, God, you would stir their hearts to have this unconditional, supernatural love that would work in them, God, that would reach into the lives of their family members, their friends, Lord, even their enemies. Lord, there's some people in this room who see people and view them as their enemy. Maybe it's a co-worker. Maybe it's their boss. Maybe whoever it is. God, I pray that they would see them now through your love. That God, their hearts would be compelled in love to love them in such a way that those people will even see it and acknowledge it and say, I don't understand. Why do you love me this way? Why are you so good to me this way when I'm so mean to you? And Lord, then they could say, because God first loved me. And let me tell you about how much he loves you. That you would stir their hearts for a passion to love because, Lord, like that man who just got saved, who was a Satanist, God, that we just saw in that video, that testimony. Like that man, all it took was a woman hugging him with the Holy Spirit's power and love on her life. And it set him free from the chains of the enemy. And, Lord, I believe that some people in this place need your love because the enemy has chained them up. 
and they feel unworthy of your love and they feel like they're not good enough to have your love and they feel like they've done too much to have your love. Yes, Lord, they've already confessed it all. They've said it all, but Lord, they won't in their own selves believe that you love them. I pray that they would believe it right now, God, in Jesus' name, that they would receive it right now, Father, in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for the ones who raise their hand because of unforgiveness or bitterness or resentment. God, I pray that right now as they pray, Lord, they would pray that this unforgiveness would be lifted off, that they would speak that person's name out and they would say, Jesus, I forgive them from my heart. Forgive me for holding these things against them. I forgive them. Lord, I forgive them for what they did to me. And now, Lord, help me to love them like you love them. That, God, you would break the chains of unforgiveness and the roots of bitterness would be uplifted out of their hearts, Lord, to set them free to truly be able to love those people. And, God, in that, I believe you will bring a harvest. I believe you will bring a harvest. And, Lord, it has to come from love because, like what Paul said, Lord, if we do all of these great things but we don't love, we have nothing. Nothing's truly gained. So God, fill our hearts, fill this church, fill every leader, every pastor, every teacher with your love, God. Consume their hearts with your love, God. Work in their hearts with your love, God, so that, Lord, we can love others in that same way. We thank you for it, Father. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before we dismiss, when you go into your prayer time, Approach it with that same heart of, God, I'm here to love you and I just wanna experience your love. Because like I said earlier, how are we praying for people? Are we praying for them out of love or are we just praying them because, oh yeah, I gotta pray. You may say, well, Pastor Reese, that's easier said than done. It really is, yeah, it is. But I believe this, if you ask the Holy Spirit to help you because he's called the helper, I believe if you ask him to help you to walk in that love every day, that he'll allow you to walk in it because that is a fruit of who he is and it will be evident in this world. Amen, amen.